Hi, everybody. Welcome to 20Q, 20 Questions with Interesting People, where we learn the origin stories of everyday superheroes in the LGBT community and friends. I am your host, the very handsome Tim Kirk, and our guest this time is rock on tour, bon vivant, man about town, producer, writer, and actor, Patrick Lagonis. Patrick is a multi-hyphenate and is the creator of the digital series Scales. The series centers around Remy Howard, who is drawn to complicated people and relationships. Remy is a series protagonist who's surrounded by people who are searching for love, even when it's not best for them. Scales quickly became a digital series hit as it has reached almost 100,000 views and has over 1,100 subscribers. The series has been licensed to two major platforms, the On Channel, which is led by Emmy-nominated actor Brian J. White, and Reverie, the largest LGBTQ streaming platform that is available in over 200 million homes. The streaming platform has projects from Whoopi Goldberg and Laura Linney. Scales will arrive on Reverie next month. Scales Season 3 is already in production and will premiere later this year. Patrick first began in the entertainment arena in 1996 when he was cast in the film A Time to Kill alongside Sandra Bullock, Samuel L. Jackson, and Matthew McConaughey. Along with his film debut in A Time to Kill, he was also featured in 48 Hours with Dan Rather, as well as being featured and interviewed on The Lisa Show with Lisa Gibbons. In 2018, Patrick launched his own production company, IMPLS Productions. Scales can be found on YouTube, and Patrick resides in Atlanta with his husband, Robert. Hi, Patrick. Good about your background. Where were you originally from, and what was it like? Okay. Uh, well, it's it's funny that you say that because I'm actually from a little bit of two places, the Midwest. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I lived there for a few years, and then we relocated to Canton, Mississippi, which is the deep south. So I have a mixture of Midwest and Southern, real Southern uh, values in me for the most part. And you are now located. I now live in Atlanta, Georgia, where I have lived here for the past 20 years. 20 years? Really? Yes. Wow. 20 years. Looks like a much younger man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's the lighting. I'm pretty sure it's the lighting, <laughs> but I appreciate it. So based on that, what can you tell me? What life experience had the greatest impact on you? I would say that the, the, the greatest experience would be moving to Atlanta. I moved here. I moved to Atlanta right after I graduated from college. Literally the day after I graduated from college, I moved to Atlanta. And I would say coming to a city, which is metropolitan, although it's the South, it was a great experience for me because I was able to meet a lot of people who, like myself, I had just sort of, I officially sort of came out once I graduated from college. So I was able to be in a city where there were a large population, you know, LGBTQ plus people that we share a, some, I guess, common goals, common things. And then too, just being able to really be in my own, comfortable in my own skin. That's what Atlanta gave me. It gave me to be able to kind of live authentically myself and out loud. And it's also the place where I met my husband. So I really think that Atlanta was the sort of foundation of me evolving into the person that I've become. I, I completely understand. Uh, I'm, I, I'm in Chelsea and uh, Chelsea, New York is just, you know, you take so much for granted being gay. Uh, you, you, you forget that other people have a struggle that you don't have anymore, you know, and you're able to thrive and prosper and, and you know, get a lot of stimulation and motivation from other people who are in your community because there's a lot of strength in the community. Yes, so uh, absolutely. I absolutely love that. Um, so since you've got such this, this, this illustrious career, uh, what would you say to anyone interested in an aspect of your experience? Meaning if someone wants to explore an idea or perspective opportunity based on what you can tell them, what would be the main thing to encourage or discourage them? Um, I would encourage them to, to write their truth. You know, I think for me as a creative and definitely as a writer, being able to share some of my own personal experiences and writing from my experiences 
helps for me to tell a more captivating story, you know, because scales, um, our, sc scales, the web series, there are some elements that are loosely, and I say this to him loosely based on some of my adventures when I was in my twenties. And so I would tell them to, you know, don't give up, be fearless in it and, and find yourself a tribe of people that also have the same drive and passion. So that way you guys keep each other they're motivated. So it really ties back into, you know, what I say about Atlanta being the place that gave birth to me being this person that I am. I would tell that to another creative is find your tribe and then write and write and write from what you know and continue to be determined and self-motivated. And I think that'll take you, it'll take you as far as you allow it to take you, as far as you want to go with it. Yes, I think it's pretty cool advice. Um, and wow, we have a lot to talk about, but what would you say is your most noteworthy achievement? Ah, uh, gosh, that's, that's another, that's a great question. And I, I, I'm going to say professionally, I would say, especially as a creative, being able to produce and create a digital series at now we're going into our third season. That's something that I, I th yeah, third season. And honestly, Tim, when I made season one, it was a passion project. And I thought, okay, maybe if I get just a hundred views, I'll be okay with that. And if I get hundred subscribers or 50 subscribers, I'll be fine. I was like, that's all I needed. And here we are two years later, I'm almost at a hundred thousand views. I have almost 1200 subscribers. And now I'm on, I'm going to be on two major and one global streaming platform for my series. And I'm just like, wow, you know, it's, I never, I didn't see this happening. So I look, looking back now, I, I feel like that's the biggest and best thing that's happened to me from a creative standpoint and professionally. And of course, personally, because I'm a big cheese fest, meeting my husband, that's the, that's been the greatest success for me at this point. That's excellent. I, I have uh, I had I worked for NBC Universal for a long time, and I was actually involved with out at NBC Universal. I was the event lead, so I did Pride and I did a bunch of things like this. And a lot of people I know who were were on air. So uh, I I worked with a number of people, and after uh, I left NBC, uh, it was suggested to me that I do a podcast, and I started to uh, interview all of these other people who I work with are all friends of mine. And, and the first few of them were just these people from NBC. But it turns out that one of them is, a, a, is, a, is an Afghanistan uh, military vet who's transitioning from male to female, and he's a vegan, or she's a vegan. Uh, someone else is, uh, I mean, it just, it just, goes, just, it just goes on and on and on and on. So uh, I had that incredible stimulation uh, of having that. And I did not expect at this at all to turn snowball into what it tur it's turned into. So I can understand that a little bit. You know, I was just I was talking to my friends, you know, and it turns out that some of my friends are really, really interested, you know. And I never thought that it would go beyond just, you know, the few people that we knew. Yeah. And it's amazing, by the way. It's your it, you, this is your that, that's your your happy spot. It's hot. You thrive as a creative, and that's I, I love your content. It's amazing. So hats off to you. Well, thank you. And and it's just it's just it's just something I just it's, you know I, what you're saying is just like where you come from. You do the best from the motivation and not expecting it to be anything bigger than just what you. It's a passion project, I guess. You know, and I, I got very lucky that way. So um, this is always a good one because uh, people always tell me things, and I'm usually very surprised. Uh, the biggest personal challenge you've faced is a personal injury, a seemingly overwhelming task, a personal or professional goal, a difficult situation you had to overcome? I would say the difficult thing that I had to overcome, and it, it's, it, it's no, it's, it's, it's going to sound, it may sound weird, but I mean, I think we kind of all deal with it, especially, you know, being, you know, being open, open, being openly gay with your, you know, openly gay or out, however you want to define it is finally being at a place where I'm 100% comfortable in my skin. I, I think I used to, I was part-time comfortable being gay, meaning 
depending on who I was around, I probably wouldn't say, oh, well, I'm a gay man or whatnot. I, I felt like I had to be very guarded about who I was. And, and I, I eventually realized that by doing so, I'm not one, I'm not being fully authentic. I'm denying people to really get to know me. I'm denying the wonderful, loving relationship that I have with my now husband and just so many other things. And I used to really struggle with trying to be my full self or wanting people to kind of accept me for me versus now, this is who I am and you either like it or don't, but I don't, I don't give a F if you do, because I love who I am and the people that love me, love me. And that's all that will ever, ever matter. I will never go back into the closet to deny myself from being who I am to make someone else feel comfortable. Well, that is really cool. Um, you know, as, as a, a number of people have told me, like the person that said was a vegan, uh, she came out as transsexual in February and in August she told everybody she was a vegan. Nobody blinked about the <laughs> transsexuality, but telling people she was a vegan, people flipped out. <laughs> this is who I really am. <laughs> And a few other people told me very similar stories of just striving to be who they are and making sure they feel comfortable being authentic. So you have a lot more in common with a, with a number of people who have actually been guests on, on the show, too. So this, this is a common theme that a lot of people are dealing with. I even have a friend of mine who used to be an evangelical Christian who is now an atheist. Uh, and he was a big Richard Dawkins guy. And um, he uh, the struggle he has... Is, 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 is a lot of parallels to, to coming out because his, he can, all his people in his family are still very, very devout. And uh, he um, used to um, get dressed up in a suit on, a, on Sunday mornings and uh, stand on a landing in a mega church in Florida. And he was a catcher. He caught people who, who thought they were having, who felt that they were having religious experiences. And uh, I said, you, you're the catcher. He said, yeah. He said, a Holden Caulfield, the catcher in their eye, and complete blank. It turned out that he had been so um, um, uh, guarded that he had never heard of this book. And I gave it to him, and it turned, it changed his life around to the point where uh, not only does he have a tattoo of the geese leaving Central Park on, on his peck, the first tattoo that he got, but he wound up being on the float two years in a row. <laughs> on <Game> wow. <laughs> wow. And, he, he cited me being a transformative person in his life. And I didn't think I, I had anything, but it's, it's, it's actually a very similar parallel. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of that. People are really, really striving to be who they are. And they, they feel they have a lot of personal stuff to, to overcome. And that makes them who they are. So uh, that's really cool. So um, what would you say was the transformational moment in your life, a meaningful gift, a reason to belong to something, being a parent, a good job, bad job? Uh, I would say it would be 2015, and we're coming up on the anniversary of it, actually, June 25th, when the Supreme Court made uh, same-sex marriage legal everywhere, because that's the day that my now husband and I, we sort of proposed to each other oh. the same time. And to me, it's it's meaningful because... A, a year later, well, almost a year later, we would be, you know, getting married. And that's that we thought would happen, but maybe not in the lifetime to where it would be legally, the same-sex marriage would be legal everywhere. Like it's, it was a huge validation. And so for me, that's kind of like the biggest, biggest thing ever. And the fact that when we got married, our friends and family was there at our wedding. And it was just something like, wow, we never really thought, we thought we'd be much older before it became legal everywhere. Like maybe we'd be in a walker or something, you know, before it, everybody could finally do it. So that to me is the, the biggest thing for me. I completely understand that. My husband proposed to me in um, Provincetown in uh, 1991. And wow. uh, we, we never thought we'd be oh ever get legally married. So we married each other, you know, mm -hmm. and then um, when we got married again, uh, we got married legally. Uh, uh, we got married in 2009 in Connecticut. 
um, because we needed to uh, do some legal stuff to make sure that we were protected. And we right. said, well, let's just do that. And I, we went there armed, armed for bear. We, we, we marched in there and we were going to be all militant. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we, we believe you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we, we took the wind out of ourselves. But we wanted, and because we really, really never thought that it was ever going to happen in our lives. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it's just a fantastic thing. Um, so what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? Wow. What gets me going in the morning is knowing that I still have I still have a responsibility as a creative to bring content that is representative of a community that is often marginalized or so placed in a box of so many stereotypes. So I know this is going to sound very gimmicky or whatnot, but I I'm constantly always having ideas come in my head about what kind of stories I'd like to create, write, or even film or what have you. And it's because I, I look at I look at the content that we're creating now, even the content that you're creating, Tim, is that a hundred years from now, when we're no longer here, unless they invent something and we're able to be here as holograms, there will be a generation that will discover what we have left for them to where there's so many stories that they'll be able to see our legacy of where, where things used to be. And hopefully a hundred years from now, or even 50 years from now, there will be, have been so much amazing change in the right direction that the people that have discovered us will be like, wow, these people had to go through all of that, or this is what they were going through. And this is the progress that they were making. And these are the creatives that were doing X, Y, Z. It'll literally be this new, I won't call it a Harlem Renaissance because you're in Chelsea and I'm in Atlanta, but there'll be this whole resurgence of amazing stories that will be discovered. And it's something that I'm always sort of holding myself responsible for because there are younger people that are just, you know, coming out or discovering who they are. And at times they may not see people that look like them or love the same person the way that they love people. And knowing that they can go to my, you know, the content that I'm creating or will create and be like, oh, here's someone that looks like me or dress like me or think like me or talk like me, or here's someone that created a podcast like you. It's, it's those elements of creativity that really gets me going in the morning. And I'm always thinking about what, what do I want my legacy to be for the next generation of people that are, you know, at the LGBTQ community that are, you know, the black and brown people. I want, I always want to represent us to the best of my ability. So that is something I'm always trying to think of each and every day. It's really cool. And it's funny, as you're saying this, uh, uh, I'm pretty friendly with somebody who's a very well-known gay activist who actually is a host, uh, a co-host of Gay USA, which is a, a cable and it's, it's around the country. And he just posted today footage from the very first gay rights march. It wasn't even a you know, gay, gay pride parade. And uh, it's somebody, there was a, a lesbian woman who was a good filmmaker. She documented, she had the presence of mind to do all this stuff. And you look back and you go, that was 50 years ago. Wow. That was 50 years ago. <laughs> it's, it's just something else. And it's just one of those, it's just what you're talking about. It, it, the impact is so strong and it still resonates. And I got to meet one of the people who was arrested in the riots. He wrote a book. Uh, 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 called I like, kept, uh, kept on dancing or something like that. And he talks about, you know, uh, the stuff. He's still a firebrand. Uh, a few of the other folks have slowed down a little bit, but mm -hmm. you can see the passion, the, the, the fire burning in him to, to, to keep this up because I say to people all the time, we, we get, uh, the roll arise a little, little bit at me. So coming out is a continual process. You have to do this every day to people all the time. You can't just say it once and get it over with. It's like people agreeing with something in principle, and then they just then they, they just forget about it. You, you got to keep on doing it. And th the incentive that you have to do this is, is such a great motivator. You know, it, it, it keeps keeps things going. It doesn't stop. You know, it, it keeps that the engine burning. You know, it, it, you've got to keep going, and I think that's fantastic. So, um, based on telling, oh, telling me what gets you up in the morning, what's the first thing you want to come to people's minds when they think of you? Oh gosh, the first thing I want people to think when they think of me is 
a probably a genuine person, uh, a genuine gifted creative. Those are things that I would like because I am a genuine person. I what you see is what you get. Like if you were to run into me two weeks from now on the street somewhere, I, this is this is me. I'm like, hey, Tim, how's it going? Like, you never have to guess what my mood is because this is literally the. It's a decision, a conscious decision that I've made to always wake up thankful, one, that I got to wake up and to treat people how I want to be treated. So you never will have to know what kind of, you know, what kind of mood I'm in or whatever. So like literally, if, I, I won't be in New York anytime soon because New York is one of my favorite places. But if we ever run into each other somewhere in Chelsea and I'm getting a hot dog or something and I see him and you say, hey, Patrick, I'll be like, hey, Tim. And we're and just probably started for conversation because that's that's the kind of person that I am. I'm always, I'm always that guy. And I hope to always be just regular Patrick. I completely understand that. And that's another common theme with people who they strive so hard to be genuine that they're never going to let go of that now. You know, it, it, it took so hard. It took such a long time and it was so hard for people to actually get over that hump and to make sure that they're establishing themselves that once you embrace that, it's like, you know, you don't have to be in the closet. You don't have to have a story. You don't have to do anything. Your conscience is free. You feel so great. And you can't imagine not being your genuine self. Right. You know? You know, so that's fantastic. So based on that, what is your Zen? Uh, my Zen. My Zen is listening to anything by Alina Baraz. It's very mellowed music and like I'll put that on and it totally I can meditate for hours just listening to her her album. It's very mellow. It's very mellow. She's listed as like I think an R&B artist, but her sound is so chill that it just puts me in a I write to her music. I um I go to sleep to her music. Like I, I know it's probably not the best thing to do is going to sleep with headphones in, but I literally go to sleep listening to her music. And it's just, it puts me in such a calming place because she has one of those voices that just, it just puts me, I don't know. It puts me like, in, you know, like on an Island or something. I feel like I'm just relaxed and there are no worries. So listening to anything by Alina Baraz, that puts me, that's like my Zen happy place, just listening to her mellow, chill music 24-7, which I'm actually going to listen to <laughs> probably once once this is over. I'm going to listen to some Alina Baraz because I love her that much. That's so cool. I'm uh, I'm known as somebody who does the, <laughs> my husband rolls his eyes at me. I, uh, my Zen is uh, I, I doing the dishes. You know? Washing yeah. dishes? <laughs> Oh it's my just, God. I'm, 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 I was a chef for many years and I, I cooking is also my Zen, but, uh, uh just the, uh, like, because you lose yourself and all you try to do is just, you just stay and you focus on something that's not about you and it's not about my personality and it's, and, and I get lost and just go, go through something that is very, it's, it's, uh, it's emotionally and physically therapeutic. Uh, it, gives me that release and it gives me the, it gives me the, the endorphins and you know, whatever you need that, that, that place that puts you in that chill place. It does that for me. And I, and I, and I get the, <laughs> what I do, you know, it's just happens. Oh my God. That's my thing. So, um, I, yeah, I, I cooked, uh, I was lucky enough to, um, uh, know some very, very talented people in, uh, culinary world. And, uh, I managed to cook for some really great places. And uh, my heart just broke recently because a number of them have gone out of business in New York. And I never thought that some of these places would ever go because they were institutions. And I just, oh, you know, that was a little shot to my zen right there. And knowing because that, that represented a place in my mind. And uh, it, was a, it was peace of mind, knowing, remembering, calling that. And they're gone. And, I, and to see that they're selling off the equipment, I said, oh, no, 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 you can't. And they have to, you know. And uh, right. You know, and we all have that. So um, this is a question now. A lot of people have very different takes on this. And, uh, and it's all very personal. And we've all done this. Uh, this is about the threshold. This is when you, there's no going back. You know, you, you know, you know there's no going back. You've done this. You can't possibly go back to what, what happened before. So how did you know when you arrived there? 
How did it feel to cross it? What was the significance to you? What did you leave behind? What are you glad you left? And what do you regret leaving behind? So oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I will say this. I, you know, when, you, when I experienced just over the past couple of years, really setting my mind on really being this hardcore creative, trying to make scales happen and, you know, branching out in my relationships, building new relationships. As I started to evolve into this creative, there were some friendships that sort of took a different turn. And I think people saw me a little bit differently because by day I am a corporate guy. The creative stuff is my, um, people would probably be a little surprised that I, that I am like this um, creative person. Like the Patrick LaDonis is, it's my creative, it's my creative side versus my corporate guy side. And I don't know if people that had known me really knew how to accept this other side of me. And so the dynamics of the friendship and relationship changed. And it changed into a point where there were some people that really let me down in, in terms of just, you know, trust is really big. Trust, trust is a big thing for me, Tim. And it, it goes both ways. And there was some trust lost in those situations. And for me, once I lose that, there's a certain level of that you, I, I talk with my hands, so forgive me. There's a certain level of, there's a threshold with my trusting, my, how much I'll trust you with. And, you know, Maya Angelou says it best, when the person shows you who they are, you should believe them. And I typically take that to heart, but I also give you like a second, a second chance just to see. And these were two really, really close people to me who I got to see, I really got to see something. And I had to walk away from those relationships. And those relationships, we're talking 20 plus year relationships that were now no longer going to be the way that they used to be. And again, you know, I don't really have regrets. And I think I came out of it stronger because five years ago, had you told me that two of these people would not be in my life in 2020, I would, have, I would say, you're lying. There's no way. There's no, I would, I would have argued you until I was red in the face. But then again, as I started to sort of come out of this cocoon like a butterfly, I emerged a lot stronger and I realized that people maybe only come into your life for a season. And I developed a much deeper respect of myself. And so after finally being at that place with myself, I know that I can't go back. So the only regret I would have is that maybe I wish I would have known this sooner <laughs> than having to go through the growing pains of experiencing it. But I'm appreciative of what I learned and how I came out of it. And I know now that I've come out of it and how I've evolved from it, I'll never go back to it. I, I completely understand. And I understand the trust thing, too, because once someone has betrayed the trust, you, you might forgive them, but you just can't look at them the same way. You can't. You can't. It's just, and it's, it's kind of crushes you a little bit, you know, you know, but you know, you, that's just what, you know, you have to go through and, you, and you were right. People are there for sometimes just for a season or uh, you have to look at them a different way. I mean, and just, you know, you don't want to lose them, but you, you're definitely not going to hold them in the same uh, place in your heart and esteem. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. yeah so I, sure. I completely understand. And um, so that's the end of my 10 questions. Uh, have you chosen the other 10 questions? Oh, like gosh, I did. Okay. All right. So um, I, I'm going to start with the um, hobbies and okay. favorite pastimes. One of my favorite hobbies, and I don't, I, I don't even want to call it a hobby because I, I don't care. People are going to laugh at me. But I, I love soap operas. I absolutely love watching soap operas. 
it's a genre that people forget about. And I think some of the, that's the place where you learn to be, you train to be amazing because there's so many pages of dialogue that you have to watch. So I DVR General Hospital, Days of Our Lives, and um, The Young and the Restless every day. And then on weekends, I binge watch my soaps. And I have been watching these soap operas since probably 1992, I would say. Okay. Since I was, since, and, and I, I love the soaps. So I consider that like, it's a favorite hobby of mine and it's a favorite pastime because when I, my husband knows when I am watching Young and the Restless or Days of Our Lives or General Hospital, that's my time. Like, that's my time. I need that time. So that was that was one that I wanted to that I wanted to share, for sure. Well, that's awesome. Um, my sister-in-law used to be uh, she was an editor at Soap Opera Digest until it went out of business. I know. I was so sad when that yeah. happened because I that's where I got all my news from. Yes. And, and she's telling me, I think Young and the Restless is like the number one show in Italy for like 25, 30 years. <laughs> it is. It, it's, it's amazing. Young and the Restless is that's that's my heartbeat. That that in general hospital armor. Although I am a I I'm an all my children one like to live baby, but those soaps are no longer with, with us anymore. So I of course then supported the other ones, which I absolutely love. So that was yeah, that's that's one of my that's that was one question I definitely knew that I wanted to to answer and to share. Um who wait, who do you read? I would say that the book, the person that I read the most is Miguel Ruiz. Uh, there's a book, there's a book called The Four Agreements, and it's by Miguel Ruiz. And there are like these four agreements that you follow and you practice, like be a, be a person of your word, don't take things personally. And I'm constantly using that book kind of like as a self help guide for myself, so that when I get into my head over something. I'll just pull that book out because it's on my nightstand and I just go back to it and be like, okay, because Miguel Ruiz, that's such a great book that I would recommend to anybody reading because it truly is, if you follow these four agreements that you make with yourself, you really do kind of, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a new age, but a great way of living. So that was, that would be, that's another one. Miguel Ruiz, the four agreements. Miguel. That's, that's who I that's who I read and I look to that book every other night and it's on my nightstand. Like I I'm always looking at that book. Wow, so. that's really cool. I have a friend of mine, one of my friends I uh, interviewed uh, from NBC, he's a product he's a product product manager. He uh, he grew up in poverty in China in Beijing. And he uh, surprised me because he's such an elegant person. I I, I would have thought that he came from a much more prosperous background, but he he he, he didn't. And he reads a book every single day. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I That's should. I, I, that almost was a goal of mine when we first went into the stay at home, the shelter in place. But then my mind was going so many other places. But that is a. I, I mean, because I have a ton of books at home. I, I was an English major, so I have tons of books that I should read. But I. I don't. I just stick to that to that one book, Miguel Ruiz for so four agreements. So yeah. If if it's a guide, then that's well, that's the thing that matters, you know. Yeah. Um, I, my third question: anything that I want to do that I haven't gotten to do yet, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I'm going to manifest it out into the universe, Tim. I would love to appear on Good Morning America, sitting next to Robin Roberts and George Stephanopoulos, because I have been watching Good Morning America since freshman year. So since, I guess, 24 years I've been watching Good Morning America. Wow. So, and I love, I love George Stephanopoulos and Robin Roberts. And I keep saying, it's all, it's in my, uh, I have a journal of all my goals and all that kind of stuff. And I have that in my goal book, like one day, I'm going to be on Good Morning America and I'm going to sit across from them and talk to them about something because one, I truly love, I love waking up to them every morning on Good Morning America. So That's really cool. Um, I know a lot of people do this. I do it myself. Uh, not only writing it down, but expressing it outwardly. It is, 
it, I think in a lot of people feel, and I feel too, that it helps you manifest these things. Yeah, it does. Well, can I can I ask you a question, then, Tim? What 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 is yours? What do you what do you speak out? Like, what's the thing that you haven't gotten to do yet? Do you mind sharing with me? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of things that I've done that have been um, fun, uh, and uh, maybe one time stuff. Uh, the one thing that I, re- I really do want to do is, uh, and, and before I go, is to um, sing. Um, some like sing, be like Frank Sinatra in the middle of, a, of an arena singing a tuxedo and, and knocking out, you know, some some great American store songbook songs. That would be something that I would love to do. You know. Awesome. Okay. It's, and yeah, you, 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 I you never haven't it. gotten there, but I want to. It's yeah, not the same thing as going to a piano bar. You know, I want to. I want to be that guy. You know. <laughs> awesome. And now you've said it to the whole world. So now. It's got to happen. It's manifested out. It's got to happen. I feel like it's going to happen. So um, let's see. Any regrets? That was another question. I I don't believe in having regrets. You know, I, you know, talking even about the experience I said about the whole trust and saying that I wish it would have happened a little bit sooner. I still don't regret it because I learned from it. So I feel like everything that happens shouldn't be looked at as a regret, but as a lesson. And it's a lesson learned and ensuring that you don't repeat it again, you know, you know, that you come out of it stronger or wiser. So that would be, that's why I don't really have any regrets. I don't have any, I don't believe in living life in regrets. I just don't believe it. It is what it is. It's funny. My, my, my friend who's from Beijing, he has a very similar philosophy. And uh, he's, you know, he, he actually, you know, expressed, uh, you know, all the things he could have resentments and have regrets about because of where he came from. I mean, he came to this country, I think he had about $300 in his pocket and he had to deal with a lot of overt racism because uh, he was learning uh, English. He wasn't speaking as, as, as well as he speaks now. So people just, just harped on that. And he could have a lot of uh, re- regrets and resentments and uh, a lot of things. He did say the one regret that he did have, though, was uh, he wasn't able to come out to his father before his father passed away. Uh, and uh, and I think that made him more determined to not have regrets, you know, because he, that showed him was a shining example of why he should not have re- regrets at all in his life. So uh, that, as I think, is, uh, is, is equally as valid, you know. Yeah. So what's the next question? Um, um, I would say the strongest bond forged personal, professional, and social. I will actually try to, I'll look at that. It's one question, but I I have like, I guess three responses to it. Um, I would say the personal bond that I have developed would be with the, um, with the cast, with, with the crew that worked with me on scales. Um, the story, you know, there are three people that I worked with, that I continue to work with on scales. That's uh, Shirley Norman, Zane Juwani, and Jacob Ross. Shirley Norman is the director for scales. And, and I knew I wanted a, I knew I wanted a female director for the show. And, you know, she's, she's a, she's a black woman. I was like, cause sometimes they're not represented a lot in the, as a filmmaker. So I wanted someone to tell this story and, we were all total, the three of us, the four of us were all total strangers and we didn't know each other, but this project brought us together. Zane is, Zane is uh, Pakistani and Indian. And we met via online for me talking about my, you know, I was looking for a film person to tell this story. We met at a coffee shop and we talked for hours and we were like virtually strangers. And now I, I just last year I went to his dad's seventieth birthday party and the whole family was hugging me. They were like, Pat, like I feel like I have this entire new family. And that's you know, two years ago we didn't know we didn't know each other from a you know can of paint. And then there's Jacob Ross. He's my um, he's my DP, the director of photography. He had spent like six years doing a documentary over in Israel, and then he came onto the project. We were total strangers, didn't know each other, and now. We're all, we always check up on each other. We're emailing each other. We're texting each other. And that's sort of like a personal bond. And I'm an only child also, 
but it's like, I feel like I have two brothers and a sister because I care about them and we care about each other. And we always want to make sure that we're doing okay. And the fact that just three years ago, we had not come into each other's lives. And it's just amazing at what can happen when you put something out there, which I always say scales brought me a new family that I didn't really have. And now I have it and I can't imagine not having these people in my life so that's the I guess that's a personal and social bond in a way and professional professional bond would I would say um I had a manager from years ago many years ago named George Dunn and he was probably one of the best trainers for me in terms of how to be a great business person like how to really play the corporate game and be that strategic thinker and how to really come into a room and process people and get things done. And there are so many little gems that he taught me that I've never forgotten. And I think it's helped me be successful in my creative career and my professional career. And I never forgot just so many gems of advice that he gave me in the years that we worked together. And that's something from a professional standpoint that I have come to respect and I just really admire him and I will admire him forever because he is, he's just that amazing. Yeah. I have, I have someone who's been very, very good to me too. And uh, 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 he's got my eternal loyalty and uh, friendship and stuff like that because he did so much for me. So I, I understand that as well. Uh, let's see. I think you, you would do what all over again? Yeah, One thing I would do all over again. Now, Tim, I don't know if I shared this with you, but well, you mentioned it. I was in a movie called A Time to Kill many years ago. <laughs> yeah. And that movie actually was directed by the late Joel Schumacher, who recently, oh, yes. he recently uh, died, I think two days ago. Yeah. And when I was in the movie, because it's really because of him that I even got the small part in the, in the movie. He saw me at the DMV in Mississippi because we were living in Mississippi at the time and brought me over to casting and the casting assistant was Octavia Spencer, who's now, oh, you know, really? Oct- yeah, who's now Octavia Spencer. And, you know, on weekends, he allowed me to come on set to watch other, to watch the being made. And that, I think that's where I first fell in love with the whole filmmaking and storytelling. And what I wish I could do, I wish back then I would have had the courage to ask more questions that and I did I just I was just so in awe like I was just wanting to see everything but I wish I would have sort of asked more questions and really knew how to network as a teenager to sustain that relationship because I got to spend a lot of time with him I got to meet Sandra Bullock and I got to a lot during that time but again 15 years old at the time you don't know what really to ask you're just so excited to you know to see this amazing kind star which you know she was that person and it's great you know all these years later to see that she's still the humble and nice person because she she made this 15 year old introvert that i was at the time feel like a million plus dollars she was so kind to me so Uh, one thing i wish i wish i would have been able if i could go back and change that i would have talked more about I would have tried to build network something with them just to continue that relationship. But I do have those great memories, especially with even Joel Schumacher, who was just, he was just such a great person. Every time I came on set, he always made sure that people treated this young kid so kind and everyone always treated me kind when I would come on set for that. And uh, and he made it so much easier for so many gay people to step forward and and to be so confident and, and secure because he just took that chance and he just i mean i don't know was he made out of granite or something he, he's just, you know, you know to, because you have to i mean look you know it's still it's it's so difficult for so many people you know i have yeah. a friend of mine who was, who was an actor who um He's been on uh, Law and Order, and um, he was in Orange is the New Black a number of times, and he wound up being killed in, 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 uh, by security guards in, in uh, Orange is the New Black uh, in one episode. And uh, he, the way he talks about, you know, being, being an out gay actor in New York now, still, 
because they don't they don't want to uh, cast him for anything but uh, stereotypical punky parts. Because if it, it, they're a wise guy type of thing, they, they don't want to cast him as an out gay man. They don't want him to do that stuff. They want him to be something that's not who he is. So, you know, it's this is 2020, and he's, he's, yeah. he's still fighting that stuff. Yeah, and you I know? wish people would get rid of that narrative. And, you know, again, that's why, you know, whether it's going to be scales or something else, Tim, like if you ever, if you get some time, if you watch the series, my show, the scales actually has actors that are, that are, that are, that identify as gay and straight that are playing these roles. And I intentionally wanted that mixture because I wanted people to see that we can, we can play, it's acting. We can play anything and we can do anything, whether you're gay, straight, whatever. It's, it's an acting, it's an acting role. It's make-believe. You're telling a story. And I, I hate that there's still, there's still a work to be done. Hence, that's why I feel confident in saying whether it's 50 or 100 years from now, when the, the next generation find our holograms of work, Tim, that we've left for them to see, they'll see, hey, th- th- there was work that was really being made. That's why 50 years or 100 years later, they're able to now enjoy all of the work that stemmed even from Stonewall to here and every, you know, 20 from 50 years ago to 2020 and so forth. So here's, here's a little, just one little aside. Years ago, uh, the, I know, you know the Eagle, Mm-hmm. The, the original Eagle is on was on 21st Street and 11th Avenue in Manhattan, and it uh, was owned by one guy, and it closed because he wanted to retire. There was nothing else to it, okay. Mm-hmm. And he just had he started it, opened it in 1971, and then I think just before 2000 he closed. And just before he closed, I asked him if I could go in and record the place for posterity because it's got so much cultural value to me. He said, sure, you're not the first person to do it, but bad. I said, sure, okay, fine, this. So I posted it, and uh, I had the a Leather Museum in Chicago, I think that's what it's called, contacted me. They wanted, they begged me if I, to, 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 to let them have it. I said, sure, you my guess. And they wanted to have that for posterity because it was a significant milestone. And it's and, and it's not that I did it. I just you know I just shot the video of it. But they wanted to have some sort of documentation of this place because, as you said, in twenty years, fifty years, a hundred years, people will look back and they go, "Yeah, that's where all that stuff happened." And so right. that, that it was a significant contribution you're making, and that that is actually as real and true as as we are saying. It, it actually is. It, it has that much of an impact on people, you know. Yeah. So. That's that's as valid as anything that anybody does. Is what you're doing is absolutely important. I mean, it's critical. It's critical for people going forward. The people who are younger than us, and I'm I'm a bit older than you, uh, they step into a world that is a whole lot easier for them. And I, I just did a uh, one of my pods a few weeks ago. I saw the very first time I went to a gay bar, which was a place called Boots and Saddle. <laughs> which wound up becoming it, it, it was on Christopher Street. It was it was a place that uh, it was at the time it was a leather Levi bar, and uh, it, it became a drag bar, which was a scream. It was a riot of the place, but it closed down ultimately. But I talked about uh, uh, my I, I tied it with uh, T. S. Eliot's "A Love Song" with J. Alfred Prufrock because I I was in my head at the time, and it was all it was all about the regrets in life and all the things that you did. And what was the impact? And what was the importance? And what was the significance? And uh, it, it, it actually kept a resounding in my head over and over and over again, because do I dare? Will I dare? You know, I talked about what you remember it. And it's all it's all in the, the poem by Elliot. And it's, it's all re- reflected in my mind of what it was like to go and do that the first time and to be part of that, because it really did have an impact. And I said one of the things that people didn't have, there was no G-L-S-E-N. There was no P-flag. I didn't have a fruit fly. I had no support network. I had nothing. And now they come into the world and their parents are 
happy that they're 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 comfortable with themselves instead of hating them, mm-hmm. and then they're, they're embraced and they have all these they go to school and there's and, and, and there's not a single problem for a lot of people you know and I never ever ever had that so what you're doing is making life so much better for people six months from that you know not just 20 years from that you know it's it's a it's, it's an important thing so have, have we gotten to the last one? Or do you have any a few more questions that you had? Did, did you ask? Uh, that that was it. That was all I had because there there were so many great ones. And then I was, I sometimes because I am a little long winded, Tim. I tend to answer multiple questions. I mean, within a question, I'll go on on and on. So those are like those are the ones that I really was like, okay, I want to definitely share these with Tim and everyone that's listening. So, well, that's been fantastic, and thank you and. Uh, uh, it's been absolutely great meeting you, and I do hope we do bump into each other sometime. It, it, we it, we it, are. We we're, I'm already. I'm putting. We just said speak it into the universe. I'm gonna meet you, Tim. We're gonna be. I'm gonna be getting a hot dog. I'm gonna see you. We're gonna just start laughing and talking, and then we're gonna go somewhere and have a drink. And it's just gonna be a great day in New York. So uh, that's it's, it. it's been a great day so far meeting you. Thanks so much, Patrick. And I'm gonna end it as as I always do. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you next time. And as the kitties say, peace out. All right, peace out.